and we are live. Hello, everyone. This is another daily objective. And today's daily objective is trying to understand what is happening with the media and their narrative in the last two months with COVID and with the riots and the protests. And I'm the only co-host. I'm the only host today. My co-host Gloria, uh, the gods of the internet, have come between us, but maybe she'll join us at some point. But we have a guest, and our guest is Spike editor. Brendan O'Neill. Hi, Brendan. Hi, how's it going? Very good, thanks. So I'll try to set what we've seen in the last months and if you can explain me what's happening because I'm really confused. So when the COVID pandemic started, we saw the media jumping on the side that says that this is something very, very serious. And there's actually an argument that in the UK, the media and where one of the actors that put pressure on Boris Johnson to switch his tactic and put us on a very serious lockdown. And in the United States, we've seen the media quite often ridiculing Trump when, for example, he said, well, there are some good news. Now, maybe he should be ridiculed, but there was a, there was a lot of this element that, no, things are very, very serious. And this reached a peak in the UK with the Dominic Cummings case. Mm. So. The, so it was re revealed that Dominic Cummings traveled to Durham. In my opinion, he did something which is sensible to protect his, his family. But we saw the media camping outside of his house and demanding that he gives an explanation about what he did. They a lot of journalists demanded that he resigned. And then came the George Floyd tragedy. And then within two days, the narrative switched. And in the beginning, there was this very weird, almost cognitive dissonance. So at the same time, we're told that there is no such thing as a group called Antifa, but at the same time, Antifa means you're anti-fascist. So if you're not with Antifa, what's wrong with you? And at the same time, in the first days, we were told that the riots are were happening by infiltrators, white supremacists, but at the same time, that we should be in solidarity with the protest. And I think the most, the weirdest moment was when we had big protests in the UK and the US. And now the narrative changed again. And now the narrative was that racism is the big pandemic and not COVID. So the same people who were ridiculing 10 protesters in the US who showed up with some guns in, the, in, in their local capital or whatever, now suddenly the, the narrative was, look how beautiful this is. So I don't believe in cabals and I don't believe in like journalists being one thing, but Help me understand what's happening here. Um, it's a, a lot is happening. I think there are the, the first thing, as you've indicated, there is just extraordinary double standards. So if you are anti lockdown, if you are pro Trump, if you took to the streets at any time over the past two or three months to signal your disapproval of the largest shutdown of civil liberties in living memory, you were denounced as evil. People were told that you would kill old people. You were basically the worst person on the planet. And then, you know, fast forward a few weeks and the huge vast numbers of people who took to the streets under the banner of Black Lives Matter were described by the same media outlets as heroic, wonderful, brilliant, and so on. We even had the bizarre spectacle of public health experts writing a collective letter which said that it is um, these Black Lives Matters protests are incredibly important and people should be allowed to do it. Um, and regardless of the risk posed by COVID, and they explicitly said in their letter, this does not extend to people who want to protest against the lockdown. So we even had the marshalling of science to this extraordinary double standard where if you protested against uh, George Floyd's awful murder, you were, that's fine. You probably wouldn't catch the disease. And even if you did, it didn't really matter because you're doing a good thing. But if you protest against the lockdown, you're an evil person and you, you deserve to die. So it was just remarkable. It was a good snapshot of how uh, modern culture is rehabilitating the ideas of good and evil. So there was an incredibly um, clear moral binary was defined between people who were agitating against the lockdown because they believe in civil liberty and people who agitate against the lockdown because they support Black Lives Matter. And, and there was almost a sense that if you went on a Black Lives Matter protest, you would be protected from the virus. 
it was like uh, it was like something from the book of revelations you know the plague will not visit the the the, the non sinful i mean it was almost uh, this religious belief so just staggering staggering hypocrisy of the light that we haven't seen for a very long time now as it happens I am anti-lockdown. I think the lockdown was a mistake. I certainly think it's a mistake for Britain to be in week 13 of the lockdown. It is devastating the economy. It has, it has de devastated our everyday freedoms. Um, so I'm glad that the Black Lives Matter protests took place and I'm glad that they pretty much signaled the end of the lockdown, right? You can't sustain the lockdown after that. But I'm still angry that all those people who pushed back against the lockdown in either a small way or a large way were demonized to an extraordinary level. Um, and now these people are not being demonized. So I think we've had a glimpse into the moral, the double standards that take place in contemporary public discussion, and also the way in which um, the racism issue has been turned from a political problem, in my view, a shrinking political problem, as it happens, um, it's been turned from a political problem into a public health crisis. And the argument that's now being put forward is that racism is a larger pandemic than COVID-19. But of course, racism is not a pandemic. Racism is not a disease. Racism is not a virus. Racism is a prejudicial ideological view that sees some people as being inferior to others. I don't think anyone benefits from this creeping redefinition of racism as a public health problem rather than as a political problem. So this, the challenge now is try to find why is this happening. So I don't believe for a second that there is this leftist cabal in the media, because I don't think that 99% of these people have read one line from Marx. <laughs> so, but I think there is, in a way, a class element. There is this element that we have. So what I saw these days is basically it was like a flexing. It was these opinion makers saying, we will tell you what is a good decision and when you should go out. So you, Dominic Cummings, how dare you take this, in, have this individual judgment and decision when we forbade you from doing this. But now that we give you the thumbs up, you people can go out. So, but how do you explain that this is almost like orchestrated? So is this group thing? Is it something else? Like many years ago, in one of our common friends around the Battle of Ideas group said, wait till the kids that grew up with new labor become like the new opinion makers. And I would say, wait till the new products of the modern university take their positions in public life. So for example, we saw the publisher of JK Rowling today, uh, there was almost a strike and I thought, wait a minute, why is this weird? These people who now work in this industry probably grew up with, in the, and they were taught that there is no nuance, that it's a black and white issue, and you cannot come across allowable opinion, sorry, different opinions. So is this what is happening in the media? Because again, I don't believe that suddenly there is this kind of left wing uh, kind of turn in the media. So why do you think we see this phenomenon? I, I, I agree that the, the I dislike the idea that the left has taken over the media, primarily because I don't see this as left-wing thought at all. Um, you know, call me old-fashioned, but I, I see the left as um, having once been a pretty progressive movement, a movement that was interested in countercultural freedom, in freedom of speech, in the right to publish pamphlets, in the right to political organization, in the right to strike, um, and also uh, it was generally interested in economic questions. So that old fashioned left, which was interested in class and power and um, freedom and democracy has completely and utterly disappeared. And people who call themselves left wing now are not what I recognize as left wing at all. They're obsessed with issues like race and gender um, and um, cultural questions rather than economic questions. So uh, I, I disagree, I, I, I agree with you and I disagree with others who say that the media has been taken over by the left. I think really, I think groupthink is a very large part of this. And I think we should not underestimate the extraordinary conformism that has emerged around the issue of Black Lives Matter, around the issue of race, around the issue of white privilege. All these things have moved from the academy into the mainstream of public life. You know, we now have the Archbishop of Canterbury, Nigella Lawson, 
James Corden on American late night TV, every newspaper pretty much, um, every single celebrity, every social media platform, they all now push this idea, which was once just the preserve of critical race theorists on campuses, but it's now become completely mainstream, which is the idea that every single facet of life is defined by race, every single misfortune faced by black people is a product of racist history, every white person is complicit in racism. I mean, these were once eccentric ideologies that the majority of people would have rejected. Now they have been completely mainstreamed. And I think the pressure on people to adhere to this way of thinking is incredibly strong. And I think the media is really accentuating that with its current campaigning. So looks like we solved our internet issues with uh, Gloria. Gloria, set up and we'll be with you in, uh, in one minute. So Brennan, one more thing I want to ask, and there's the question around the BBC. And there's been, there's been this discussion that says that we need to have such a broadcaster because it kind of expresses the soul of the nation, whatever that means. But quite lately, I, I wonder if there is such a thing as, let's say, a consensus on what are our values and what is uh, what is that we stand for. So, for example, I was thinking the other day that, in a way, Black Lives Matter today have more moral authority than Winston Churchill, or in the United States than, I don't know, Thomas Jefferson. So it's easier today for me to mock Churchill rather than to criticize Black Lives Matter. So is there, in this atmosphere, is there even a point in having some like BBC, which is supposedly kind of encompasses the the the, the soul of the, the the consensus of the nation. Um, I think there's less and less justification for the BBC because, as you say, the BBC emerged as the public broadcaster. It was speaking to the British public, and actually, its initial mission was to provide the highest form of culture and the highest form of discussion to as large as uh, as many people as possible. So it was a public mission. And it was quite often a, a uh, an elitist public mission. It saw its, its role as getting into the homes of every single person and providing them with opera to lift them out of the ignorance that they were living in. So there was an, uh, there was an element of elitism, of course, but there was, um, there was a positive kernel to it which was this notion that there is such a thing as the public and there is such a thing as high art, high culture, high discussion, then it, and it was worth promoting that to as many people as possible. Both of those ideas have completely collapsed. We now live in a world in which there's no, there's no such thing as the public. Identity politics has seen, uh, has seen to that, that we now are completely fragmented. Everyone conceives of themselves as a minority group or an identity group or some fragmented group. So the idea of the public has completely frayed. And, and so the question of who the BBC is speaking to is always being raised and is always on the agenda. And the idea that there is a distinction between high art and low art, between high culture and pop culture, between uh, meaningful, important discussion and just soundbite news, that, that uh, distinction has, uh, has broken down too. And now, um, you know, working class people are given EastEnders, Asian people have got the radio, BBC Radio Asian Network, um, and, and every group is provided with a culture that is seen as being fitting to that group. That's so incredibly divisive. So the BBC's original mission becomes increasingly impossible in those circumstances. And that does definitely call into question the possibility of having a public broadcaster. Maybe it's time, in my view, it probably is time, for the BBC to become a subscription service along the lines of Netflix and Amazon Prime and all the rest of them. And people can choose whether to subscribe rather than being forced by law to pay the BBC, which is currently what we have. If we reconstitute the idea of the public, reconstitute the idea of shared values and reconstitute the idea of um, some important culture that must get to as many people as possible, then maybe we can have a public broadcaster again. But right now, in my view, it makes less and less sense with every passing day. Uh, that's a very good point, that in order to have a public broadcaster, you need to have at least the aspiration of the idea of a public. Gloria, you look like you're still struggling. When you're ready, just give us the thumbs up and 
I'll, I'll probably give you the last word because uh, we, we had this problem today. So Brendan, my last question is, and I had this idea first when I saw that now in famous Kathy Newman, Jordan Peterson moment. And this question is, don't the media actually care about their credibility? So for example, in the last three years, I've caught myself telling to my students that, you know, I used to tell them, don't quote the sun in an article. Now more and more, I'm saying, don't quote the guardian because there, there are things that I see in the guardian that I would never imagine that they read. So what, don't they really care about their, not even long-term, like their, their current credibility? So when, isn't there like an instinct of self-preservation? It would be the equivalent of you, for example, on Spike saying, you know what? Uh, I have, uh, you know, I'll throw all the, the standards from the window. I don't care about my viewership. I'm going to follow like whatever I want to do. And who cares about my, you know, my standards? Yeah, I think the media is in trouble. The media is unquestionably in trouble. Opinion polls continually show collapse in public trust in the media. That's been growing for quite a while, um, particularly during the Brexit period and also more recently during the COVID-19 crisis. Fewer and fewer people trust the media as a source for reasonable, true news and information. Um, and I think that's all the fault of the media. Everyone always talks about the cynical, stupid, ignorant public who are being led astray by fake news and fake websites and adverts on Facebook and all that nonsense. Actually, it's down to the media itself. The media has um, screwed things up. They have lost sight of what their mission is. They've lost sight of what they are supposed to do, which is report the news and analyze the news. And the media, to a large extent, has become a, a, a political manifestation in itself. And they see themselves now as the genuine opposition, particularly in the UK, also, I think, increasingly in America the media thinks that it is the opposition to the government. And, and they will often say things like, well, if we don't hold the government to account, who will? Which sounds like something one should support. It sounds like, oh, that's a good democratic mission, but that's not the role of the media. The people who, ho the people who hold the government to account are the people. That's why we have a democracy. The role of the media, as the name suggests, is to mediate information and to tell us what's going on in the world and to report faithfully and honestly facts and information and, and analysis. So over the past 10 to 20 years, the media has become almost like a campaigning body. Um, it's become increasingly cynical. It's become um, very uniform in its outlook. Uh, and I, I've seen this myself, you know, if I think back to all the times I've been sitting in the green room of BBC radio shows or, or, or media TV shows or whatever, I, I can remember th the shrinking parameters of what it's acceptable to say and think in the British media. You know, I have a palpable sense that um, 20 years ago, you could have gone onto TV and said, listen, I think this climate change thing is being exaggerated. If you went on TV and said that now, you, you, there would be a campaign to prevent you from going on TV and it would be successful. 20 years ago, you could have gone on TV and said, listen, I don't think we should outlaw hate speech. I mean, I did that. Other people did that. It was a legitimate point of view. Now that is no longer a legitimate point of view in the media and it's a risky business to push it forward. There are many issues uh, that were seen as acceptable points of view 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago which you would not get away with now in the British media. And the woke left presents that as progress. They will say, oh, we've got rid of all these horrible racist far right views. But of course, they're not racist or far right views. They are perfectly normal views uh, about progress and freedom and openness, which are shared by many members of the public, which are no longer expressed in the media. And that is why people are switching off from the mainstream media and going looking for other sources of information on other websites like Spiked and others too. And what you said about seeing themselves as a political actor, I think nothing shows how big this is as the recent issue with the New York Times. So they published an article with which obviously it was a very objectionable opinion, which said, you know, put the army on the street. But it's not unimaginable that during riots, some part of the political spectrum is going to Say that this will be probably the equivalent of uh, the, the the De Gaulle 
right during May 68. So it's, you know, it's within what is to be expected in the political setting. And you had the news, basically you had the internal coup in the, in the newspapers. But let's finish on a positive note. And I think I've said this in, 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 during COVID that it was so encouraging to see you and spiked when no one else dared to question the lockdown. Because that's what it means to be a public intellectual. That's what it means to be, to, to, to be brave. And there were very few people in this country. It was basically you, it was Peter Hitchens in the beginning when it was very, very difficult. So do you think that more and more people will turn to, to smaller or more in, uh, kind of out of the mainstream outlets like Spike? But also, isn't there a danger there that, uh, you, that uh, we're going to have uh, you know, voices of lesser standards? Because usually this is, this is the, the, the narrative. The narrative is it's either CNN or then it's Alex Jones. So stay with us, because otherwise the standards are really low. What's your reply to that? That's a really good question. And I think um, it, it's interesting that you mentioned the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, because when I think back to that, it was very difficult to criticize the lockdown. Um, and I lost loads and loads of um, followers and friends and supporters because of the things that Spike said about the lockdown. Many of them subsequently came back because they realized that we were onto something. But it was one of those moments where you realize that your point of view makes you a, a target for abuse and, and, and puts you in a vulnerable position, actually. And those kinds of moments are not very nice. But it's really important to stick to your guns. It's really important to say, listen, this is what I think, and this is why I think it's important. Um, I think we're entering a new example of that with the Black Lives Matter moment, where there is an extraordinary amount of pressure to conform and an extraordinary amount of um, groupthink in relation to this issue. And I think it's important. There are some great thinkers in the US uh, black and white who are raising questions about what Black Lives Matter says and raising questions about these protests. And I think they, we should listen to them rather than demonizing them. I think um, in relation to the standard stuff, you know, if everyone starts reading uh, non-mainstream publications, they'll just be swallowing all this fake news. I mean, of course, there's fake news out there. No one would, de would deny that. But there is a also there's a moral panic about fake news. And it actually is very reminiscent of um, the, the printing revolution in the 1400s and the 1500s, because back then, uh, you know, the only people who could really reproduce content were, were monks with their, <laughs> with their pens, kind of writing things, acceptable things that, that priests could read to people in, in a, a language that people largely didn't understand most of the time. That's how ideas and, and ideology was protected. The, the, the birth of the printing press was an extraordinary danger to those people because it meant that you could publish anything you wanted and, and suddenly over the next 100 or 200 years people were publishing you know protestant literature and radical literature and and british people who were uh, uh, banned by law from publishing certain pamphlets would have to get them published in the dutch republic and then sneak them back into the uk and hand them out secretly in pubs and on street corners so and there was a there was a panic then too about fake news, about heresy, about the possibility that you know a lack of control would mean that people would be fed all these nonsense, dangerous, irreligious ideas. And so I see the current period as being similar to that. I think the gatekeepers of ideology, the gatekeepers of of acceptable thinking, which is the media and sections of the political class, and Silicon Valley as well. I think they feel themselves under pressure from a great swarm of people who want to do things their own way, who want to publish ideas without having the approval of the powers that be, and who want the liberty to publish and be damned. So lots and lots of nonsense and rubbish and crap and evil stuff and racist stuff and conspiracy theories, lots of that stuff will be published, unquestionable, it is being published but the benefits outweigh the negatives. And the benefits are that this, the period we are living through, which is a period of unprecedented publishing freedom, you and I can now publish things with our thumbs while we're sitting on a bus. Uh, no human in history could have even conceived of such a liberty. 
And the benefit of that liberty far outweighs the negatives. And I think we should celebrate the right of people to challenge the mainstream media, to challenge political groupthink, and to start publishing things that are different, that are true, and that are increasingly urgent. And we should really celebrate that freedom to publish and that freedom to think. On that happy note, and on that, I think that's the important thing. Freedom is a responsibility, right? Freedom means I need to process what I'm reading. But this is more important, and even if I do mistakes, than someone else telling me this is the only opinion. So I encourage people to, to visit and, and read Spiked. You're going to find things you disagree. Me and Brennan, we disagree, for example, on whether Silicon Valley does censorship. I would say no, maybe you would say yes. But anyway, that, that's, the, that's the fun thing. So Brennan, thank you very, very much. And hopefully we're going to have you in more episodes in the future. Today we had, it was only me, so we didn't solve our the problems, but Gloria will be back with us in the next days. So thank you, Brendan. Thanks thank to you. our viewers. All the best. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.